Hello and welcome to Alan at the Friesen, alanatthefriesen.com. This is English 20-1. I'm starting a new poetry series of video lectures, which I'm calling Poetry in Depth. We're going to be starting off today by looking at the poem Ozymandias by Percy by Shelley. We're going to be also going through a process that Helen Vendler talks about in her book, Poems, Poets, and Poetry, an awesome resource. So this process is part of the chapter on exploring a poem. Uh, it's, it's a descriptive analysis. There's 13 different steps to it. So what's going to happen is I'm going to read the poem, and then I'm going to go over it using these 13 steps. And by the end of it, uh, hopefully people in the class, and hopefully people who are watching, will have a better understanding of not only this poem, but also the process that Bendler goes through in order to help you understand it. So I'll start by reading the poem. Ozymandias by Percy by Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless lakes of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So the first thing that Vendler says to do is figure out what the poem means. In her, in brief, describing poems, for those of you who are in my class, it's on page 8 of your handout, it's on the very back. Can you paraphrase in prose the general outline of the poem? In this poem, we have the speaker who's talking to the traveler. And it goes right into the action, right into the description that's given by the traveler from the antique land. And he's describing a great statue that's broken. So we have... Two vast and trunkless lakes of stone that are standing in the desert. So we have the lakes of a, sta of a statue, and beside it we've got the shattered head of the statue, and then beside that we've got the pedestal on which the words appear, which is what I would consider to be the climax of the poem. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, you mighty in despair. And then after that, it sort of zooms out and looks at the entire desert about how it's boundless and bare, the lone and level stands stretch far away. Nothing surrounds the legs, the shattered head, and the pedestal. So essentially, that's what's happening in this poem. That's the meaning of it. Now, before you go further, you need to make sure that you understand what's going on in the poem. If you don't understand what's happening, you need to go back and you need to look at it. Maybe you need to look up a couple of words, like, like visage, or antique, or legs. <laughs> Still no laughter. Other classes, they, they laugh at this, so those of you at home are probably, calm down, we'll keep on moving on. Number two, antecedent scenario. So this is asking what happened before the poem starts? What started the action in this poem? And often, it's very valuable to think about this, sometimes the antecedent scenario is not that important. We don't have a lot of information in this poem. We have a speaker. I met a mad traveler. So the speaker, we don't know anything about him, except that he met this traveler from the land who said, and then it launches into what the traveler says. Now something interesting that I found out as I was, as I was looking at different versions of the poem is that in some versions, you have quotation marks starting on too vast, and then all the way to the very end of the poem, on line 14, far away. So this, in some versions of the poem, this is an entire, this is a speech act. In other versions of the poem, like I believe in the Waskana Poetry Anthology, which is what we're using, it's, there's no quotation marks there. And the quotation marks actually do change our interpretation of the poem a little bit. With the quotation marks, we've got the direct message from the traveler. The traveler is saying this verbatim. Without the quotation marks, we have an indirect quote. We have the speaker who's paraphrasing what the speaker has said interesting when you consider it that way, which I hadn't before this morning when I was looking at different versions. What provoked the speaker into utterance? Why did the speaker speak? And as I said before, we have two speakers. 
we have the, the person who met the traveler, and we have the traveler himself, whose words may or may not have been paraphrased. How is a previous, previous equilibrium being unsettled? What is this speaker upset about? He's not so much upset, but he's got this amazing story of this statue that's in the desert. And we don't know why the traveler is talking. We don't know why the speaker is talking to the traveler. So the antecedent scenario is, is very fuzzy in our minds. And we could speculate. We could imagine, you know, Shelley is maybe imagining a man who's in a pub someplace in England and is speaking to perhaps an Egyptian or maybe somebody who is part of the British uh, Foreign Service. But none of these speculations are very fruitful. They don't actually help us to understand the poem anymore. It's fun to think about, but it doesn't really help. So then, we go on to number three, which is division into parts. How many are there? Where do the breaks come? And something interesting that I learned about this poem this morning, as I was going through it again, getting ready for this, for this little speech thing here, uh, I, I did not know before this morning that this was a sonnet. Bad, Mr. Friesen. I should have twigged to this. It was when I looked at... I believe it was looking at... Like this entire Vendler process, I realized, okay, this, this poem is 14 lines. And whenever you've got a poem that is 14 lines, that's when you need to look at it a little bit more carefully and say to yourself, okay, well, was it an accident that there was 14 lines? Or is this a sonnet? So if it's got 14 lines, and if it's an iambic pentameter, iambic pentameter, and at this point if I look for my pen, pentameter. And if there's some sort of rhyme scheme at the end, then we've got ourselves a sonnet. Now for those of you that don't know what iambic pentameter means, let me go through it quickly. So first of all, the first word here, iambic, refers to the type of rhythm that's in the poem. And I am looks like this. Not stressed, stressed. This is one I am. Unstressed, stressed. I met a traveler from an antique land. The second syllable, every other syllable, syllables 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, are accented. This is an I am, as opposed, as opposed to, uh, for instance, trochaic pentameter. A troche is the exact opposite. So it's stressed and then unstressed. Double, double, boil, and trouble. So we've got the stress that comes first. Naturally, we tend to speak in iams. We tend to speak in that pattern. Trochaic, or trochies, this is not as common, and it sounds unusual to our ears. Which is why in Macbeth, when we hear the witches talking in trochaic tetrameter, 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 yes, it's, it's jarring, and it, it highlights the unnaturalness of the witches, which I will get into now. So I am, I am the pentameter, We've got the meter, right? We're talking about we're talking about the rhythm of it. Penta for five. So when we say iambic pentameter, what it means is that we've got a poem where each line has five iams, and each iam is two syllables. So each line is ten syllables long, going unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. You can also have tetrameter, as I talked about before where you have four iams, or four trochies. These are called boots, by the way. Each one of these little collections is called a boot. There's other more complicated meters as well, but we're not going to look into that. So when you divide into parts, when you realize that it's a sonnet, then what you need to look at is you need to look at the two different parts of a sonnet, which is the octave, let's get this right here, the octave and the sestet. And again, this sounds complicated. Octave and sestet. Octave for eight and sestet for six. So usually, a sonnet it is divided into two parts. The first eight, where it sets up a problem, and then the last six, where it presents a solution. Now, that is a traditional Petrarchian or Shakespearean sonnet. That's what it usually looks like problem and then solution. In this poem, we're trying to divide it up according to that. 
and it sort of works, but not really. Because the octave ends with the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and, and this is the beginning of the sestet. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, you might be in despair. Now, we've got the climax just after the sestet is, in is introduced. We've got the pedestal and we've got these words. These words that have a lot more meaning than any more meaning than anything else in the poem. So perhaps the structure of the sonnet of the sestet is setting up the meaning for us, but in my mind it's unclear. This isn't exactly a Petrarchan sonnet or Shakespearean sonnet because the rhyme scheme is odd as well. You've seen this before, I'm sure. Abba, Abba, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D, or C, D, E, C, D, E, which is Petrarchan or Shakespearean. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. And these letters just mean that the last word in A rhymes with the last word in A. So in this poem, the very first four lines, we've got land, stone, sand, frown, which rhyme, A, B, A, B. And then if you continue, we've got A, C, D, E. Command, so land, sand, command, red, things, fed, so A, C, D, E. And we've got appear, kings, despair, decay, bear, away. So the rhyme scheme is actually A, B, A, B, A, C, D, E, D, E, F, E, F, which is not really any of the traditional sonnet forms, but it starts off A, B, A, B which is what we would think of as a traditional Shakespearean sonnet. What the poet is doing is combining the rhyming scheme from the octave and the sestet and intermingling it together. And because of that, because of the intermingling of the rhyming between the octave and the sestet, that sort of eliminates our division into parts of the octave and sestet as separate. He's putting them all together, Therefore, that division doesn't really help us out in terms of understanding what's going on in the poem. It took a lot of work to get to the point where we're saying, okay, well, the octave and sestet division doesn't work, but that's the process of interpretation. We're eliminating possibilities. So then let's look at some other ways that we can divide into parts. We've got the introductory line and a half where the speaker is talking to the traveler. I met a traveler from Antique Land who said, and then we're setting up the rest of the poem. We could call that one part, the first line and a half. And then we have some description. And imagine this as if this was a camera, a video camera. And we're, we're zooming in on different parts of the statue. So sir, first of all, you've got the two vast and trunkless legs of stone. So we've got the legs, and they stand there. And then there's not a lot of description about the legs. They're vast. They're trunkless, they're made of stone, they're in the desert. Not a lot of description, so that's not very important. But then we've got the head with quite a lot of description. So it's near them, it's on the ground, its visage, its face is shattered, it's cracked. But even though it's cracked, and then we move on to the next section where we've got a description, uh, we've got a, a series, three different descriptions of what the face looks like. It starts off with a frown, okay? A slight frown, and then we have a wrinkled lip. So notice how we've got one word of description, and then we've got two words of description, and then we move to a sneer of cold command. Sneer of cold command. Five words. One word, two words, five words. So we've got a, a, we've got a climax right here. First of all, frown. So when something frowns, it, it's, it indicates that somebody is you know, vaguely unhappy with what's going on. But then wrinkled lip, when you think about somebody with a wrinkled lip, a frown and a wrinkled lip, I can see some of my students in class sort of, sort of going, what does that look like, and sort of. And then the sneer of cold command. So once we get to the sneer, and we, we add into everything else we've seen before, the frown and the wrinkled lip, we can see that this visage is, is terrifying, or very imposing, very angry. So that's a section. So we've got the Meta Traveler from an Antique Land who said as one section. Then we've got the description of the legs as one section. 
And then we've got the description of the face as another section. And then this section here about the sculptor. So tell that a sculptor, well, those passions red, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. So now we're moving from a picture of the face to the speaker imagining about the sculptor. The sculptor was so good that he was able to look at Ozymandias, look at Ramses II, and etch into stone his expression. So tell that it's sculptor, well, those passions read, but yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. And the word lifeless there is important. The fact that this, uh, this, the uh, statue is lifeless, but it's still frowning, it's still got wrinkled lip, it still has the sneer of cold command. It's just a lifeless thing, but it was sculpted so well that we can see these things on the statue. And then we have the, the next section, what I would consider to be the climax of the poem. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. So we focused from the traveler from an ancient land, to the legs, to the head, focusing on the head, and then looking at the pedestal, and the words that are on the pedestal. And we have these words, despair, look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Despair is one of the few emotions that we see in the poem, beside the wrinkled lip, beside the sneer. We've got the arrogance of the man, and then we've got him saying, all you people, all you mighty people in the world, look at what I have built and despair. And the unspoken bit of it is, because you will never see anything as great as this again. And that idea of greatness is then immediately juxtaposed with the words, nothing beside remains. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Our camera, our fictional camera, then moves from the pedestal and perhaps sweeps the desert and sees nothing. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Notice the juxtaposition. He says, I am so great, look at what I have built. When you look around, you don't see anything. This is ironic as well, right? When somebody says to you, look what I have built, it's amazing, you expect to see something amazing. But in contrast, you see nothing. You see just level sand. Irony being the difference between what is expected and what actually is. We expect to see something great, but there's nothing there that's great. So how many parts do we've got, do we have? We have the traveler, we have the description of the legs, we have the description of the head, we've got a little interlude about the sculptor and how good the sculptor did in sculpting the face of Ozymandias, then we have the pedestal, and finally we have the denouement. We have the nothing beside remains, we have the lone level stands. So the pedestal climax, after that we've got the denouement where we see that Ozymandias had built all these things but it didn't actually last. And number four, then, is talking about the climax. How do the other parts fall into place around it? We've talked a little bit about that. We've talked about how it moves from the legs to the face, to the pedestal, big climax, and then nothing. So the climax coming in the, uh, just after the sestet, the important part. The other parts. What makes you divide this poem into these parts? Are there changes in person, in agency, in tense, in parts of speech? Really, the, old, the way that I've done this is I've, I've, I've arranged it according to, to the narrative of the poem. We could go into it. We could look at agency, for instance. Who's the person in charge? Who has the power in this poem? At first, it's the traveler who's telling the story. And then it's Ozymandias who has the power in order to, to, to really build all this wonderful stuff. And then the agency shifts from Ozymandias to to nothing. There's no more agency. It's almost as if nature itself is the one that's in charge. The sand has slowly eroded these great structures. They've collapsed and they've become nothing. Find the skeleton. What is the emotional curve on which the whole poem is strung? It helps to draw a shape, a crescendo perhaps, or an hourglass shape, or a sharp ascent followed by a steep decline, so you'll know how the poem looks to you as a whole. The skeleton, the emotional curve. We have a traveler
So we have a traveler who's talking about these lakes, we talk about the shattered head, and then we have the words in the pedestal, and then it declines right after that. And we've got the lone level sands. So the emotional point here is the despair that the pedestal evokes. It's the, sh the face on the visage, you know, right here. And then it falls down. It's important to know this because this helps us understand how we interpret the poem, how we feel towards the poem. And this comes up a little bit later. Games with the skeleton. How is this emotional curve made new? We expect when we read about a great pharaoh, about the empire, we expect to read about how how wonderful it was, about the number of slaves and the pyramids and all these monuments. What's new about this poem is we have this idea of this great and powerful pharaoh and how much he's done and then how when he's been dead or after he's been dead for several thousands of years, how he's nothing anymore. How even the monuments that he built to stand the test of time failed that test. We expect to see the emotion. We expect other people to look at what he's done in despair. But then our expectation is broken when we see nothing. Nothing is left. Language. What are the contexts of diction, chains of significant relation, parts of speech emphasized, tenses, and so on? The nice thing about studying poems in English, originally written in English, is that we can actually take a look at this. And I'm not going to go too much into depth into this, but I will, because we're talking about emotion, we're talking about the emotional curve, I will, again, very quickly talk about the very emotional words that we see in this poem, which we've got shattered visage, the shattered face. So a face that's shattered. We're talking about a statue, yes, but when you think about a shattered face, there's, there's some emotion behind that, right? If we, if, we, if we talk about a real person whose face has been shattered, then we're imagining somebody who's, who's sad or upset. Literally speaking here, of course, we're talking about a statue that's been destroyed. We have the frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, that little climax within those two lines about how the emotion gets stronger from frown all the way to sneer of cold command. This arrogant man who assumes that everybody in the world is going to listen to him because he's constructed everything. And then finally, we have this line here, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And I deliberately avoided talking about that line until now because this, this line here is a little bit ambiguous and it's a little bit complicated. There's no clear interpretation. We were talking about the sculptor and then we're talking about the passions read ostensibly on the face, very obviously on the face of Ozymandias. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. You might at first think that this is referring to perhaps the sculptor. The sculptor. And perhaps it is. The hand that mocked them. Perhaps the sculptor is mocking Ozymandias in creating this, this sneer of cold command. But the them in that sentence is problematic. So because we're talking about them and not a sculptor mocking one person, we're going to assume that that line there is talking about Ozymandias. He's talking about how his hand mocked people. The hand that mocked them. Is this synecdoche? Is this an example of the hand representing Ozymandias as a whole? Certainly the next phrase after that, and the heart that fed, I would consider that definitely to be very strong synecdoche. And if you, if you take a look at what those words evoke, as opposed to what, those, what they literally mean, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And if hand and heart are representative of Ozymandias, then we're seeing a man here who is in charge of a kingdom, who mocks the people that he rules, and the heart that fed, who's perhaps feeding on them. A parasite or a vampire, not literally those things, but as the leader of a, of a kingdom, where he's forcing slaves, perhaps, to build his pyramids and his sphinx. Perhaps it could be said that he is feeding off of them, and he's mocking them, letting them, letting them create this great sculpture of him when they have no agency in deciding whether or not they want to do this. So talking about language. And then tone as well, which is also related to what we've been talking about. The change in tone as the poem progresses. 
So the tone of the poem starts off very straightforward. It's intriguing, perhaps. We're, we're thinking about a traveler from an antique land. Notice the word antique there, as opposed to ancient, which evokes something very different, an antique land. And then we've got the description of the stone lakes, and that makes us curious. Who do those lakes belong to? And then we've got the visage, the shattered visage, who's sneering. Why is this visage sneering? Why does it have a sneer of cold command? And then it talks about the sculptor who created this in reference to the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, mockery and feeding off of people. So we get the impression that the speaker in this poem is not painting Ozymandias in a positive light. And then we have, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look upon my works, be mighty, and despair. And then despair is a powerful word. Look at what I've done and feel the anguish that you will never, never build anything as great as this. I mean, it's, it's, it's your heart lurching. It's your stomach just rolling over in knots. It's a powerful emotion that's in this poem. It's not, look upon these works, you mighty, and be annoyed, or look upon these works, you mighty, and, and shrug to yourself. There's no apathy there. It's a very, very powerful word. And then the emotion drops out when it says nothing beside remains. We're, brought, we're being brought to this climax, to this fever pitch of despair, and then a very quick drop, the emotional drop. And after this, the decay of the colossal wreck, boundless and bare, low and level sands, there's, there's no emotion in that. It's very, it's very um, dispassionate. It's very non-emotional, unemotional these description of these sands that just go on. So the tone, agency in its speech acts, the main agent in the poem. So the main agent, who are the agents? First of all, we've got the traveler. We've got the speaker who's talking to the traveler. Ozymandias, depending on the version of the poem you're looking at, speaks. And in some versions, he's the only person that actually speaks. So it seems like he has a lot of agency, a lot of control. <coughs> but then that control is undermined by the next line, as we looked at, nothing beside remains. So does the main agent change as the poem progresses? It starts off with the I. I met a traveler. So we've got a person who's talking about a traveler, but then we move into the traveler's story. So the agency starts with the I, with the speaker. Then it moves to the traveler who's telling the story. And then from the traveler, it moves to the sculptor, who is who just describes his or who um, sorry, the sculptor who does an amazing job at rendering the face of Ozymandias. And then finally, Ozymandias himself. After that, we have no more agent. Everything is dead. There's nothing surrounding it. Perhaps we're back to the traveler who's looking around and seeing the lone and level sands. But really, all agency from that moment on is gone. Unless you want to consider nature itself, the, uh, the desert, to have agency. The desert having the power to wipe away what Ozymandias has built. Road not taken. Can you imagine the poem written in a, in a different person or tense, with the parts rearranged, with an additional stanza or one stanza left out? Why might the poet have wanted these pieces in this order? This is an important question asked. This is the what if question. What if the poem was set when Ramses had, or sorry, yeah, Ramses II had originally built this statue? What if the statue was intact? That would have a very different meaning. We have laborers putting together this wonderful statue. We have a sculptor etching out the face of Ozymandias. Ozymandias and Ramses II are the same person. Just don't get confused by that. I'm, I know I'm flipping back and forth between it. But in our imaginary poem, he is sculpting. He is being sculpted. And he commands that the sculptor put these words on it, and perhaps it ends there. And we have the idea that Ozymandias is this great immortal ruler, which is a very different connotation than what we have. We have the idea that Ozymandias was a very powerful ruler a long time ago, but then relating back to the meaning of this poem that nothing can last forever. That despite what we do here on Earth, in 100, 200, 500 years, 
we're going to be ashes. We're going to be dust. And what we do will not remain. If Ozymandias, if his kingdom could not remain, then what hope do we, the ordinary people, have of making any mark on this world? This word, despair, it's, it's pretty powerful. The irony of it is that we look at this poem and we despair. I know I do. If Ozymandias could create all this and it didn't last, what hope do I as an English teacher? What hope do I as a writer? What's the point in even trying? Might as well go play the weed. The road not taken. Other ways that we could look at this is perhaps the poet, perhaps uh, Shelley could have rearranged it so that the climax came at the very end. So everything the same, it's all broken up, it's all destroyed, but the very last line, look upon my works, ye mighty, in despair. The irony wouldn't be as poignant then. The last three lines talk about how the sands have destroyed everything else. Without that, those three lines of denouement, without those three lines of, of just really, poor, really uh, bring home the idea that everything is destroyed, we wouldn't have this solid image of the juxtaposition. We wouldn't have this, this, uh, this irony. It would be there, but it would be a lot less detectable, and the poem wouldn't be as interesting as a result. There's a very specific artistic effect in the last three lines, and that's allow the reader the time and the space to consider the irony of the poem. That you can, you can keep on going with this. I mean, you could, you could look at verb tense, for instance. Why stand in the desert? Why couldn't it be standing in the desert or stood in the desert? It could be past tense, right? The, the, the present tense has a very specific function of it, which I'm not going to go into now. But consider that also when you look at the roads not taken section of the Ventler analysis. The genres. What are this by content, speech act, and outer form? Now in Ventler's book, which my class doesn't have yet, in Ventler's book, it goes through these three sections, or these three different um, areas, before the uh, exploring the poem. This is sort of the, the wrap-up analysis. So I'll have to make sure that I photocopy that for you folks. So in terms of content, this is sort of, sort of a travel poem. Sort of. In a, in a travel poem, we have a person who makes a trip someplace, and once he reaches it, he has an epiphany. He has an understanding about himself, or the nature of the world, and somehow he's changed. So this is sort of a travel poem in that we're, we're traveling to a different land, we're traveling with the traveler to this antique land, and we're learning about the statue, we're learning about Ozymandias' um, statue, his head, the pedestal, all that. But the fact that, that there's no person in it, that's making the person a realization, sort of steers us away from this idea of the travel poem. Usually a travel poem is about a person who makes a personal discovery. We don't have anybody making a personal discovery, except perhaps us, as readers. It's, it's, it's very, that's the closest, um, it's the closest type of poem, the closest genre I can come up with. Speech act. This is very much a description. We have one person describing what's happening in the poem. And then finally, the outer form. This is referring to the type of form. And at this point, I'm like, outer form, okay, well, what's that? And I flip through the Vendler book, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, like, it's, it's a lyric poem for sure. Does it have a structure? And then I looked at it closer, and I came to the realization 14 lines, it's got some rhymes, oh, this is a sonnet. And what does that do for us, right? And I talked about that idea of being a sonnet before. And then finally, the imagination. What has it invented that is new, striking, memorable? in content, in genre, in analogies, in rhythm, in a speaker. As far as what makes this poem new and unique for a poem that's almost 200 years old, it was written in 1818, I believe, it's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the first poems that, that has this distance between the antique world and our own world. It's about, I mean, it, the idea that everything passes away is not new. In the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about, you know, everything will, everything will eventually be destroyed, what's the purpose, life is meaningless. But it does it looking at this historical character of Ozymandias, and making him appear fresh in our eyes, before telling us that everything that he did was for naught. It was maybe helpful for him, but it didn't stand the test of time. 
in the imagination section, it talks about how um, it looks at the Keats poem. And I think I'm probably going to stop there without going very much more into it. But this process, this 13-step process, what it allows you to do is it allows you to take yourself deeper into the poem, understand specific features about it, and by doing that, it helps you understand what's going on. It's not your final analysis. I mean, all I've done is pretty much explicate the poem. I haven't made an argument, except perhaps that this poem is about the futility of life, that eventually everybody dies and all that. I haven't really gone into much depth into that. But doing this, following this process with a poem, is the best way that you can figure out what it means. I mean, you could read the poem. You could read all 14 lines. You can come away with it with some ideas of, you know, this is maybe Egypt and maybe there's a pedestal in place. But this kind of close reading, looking at words very intently, and then following this process, really helps to bring home the meaning. There's just one more point that I want to bring up before I'm done. The first couple times I read the poem, I, this, this word didn't really stand out to me. But then this word lies, line four. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. Now th this word really struck me as I was going through it the 15th or 16th time. Lies. It has two meanings. The first and most obvious meaning is that it's just sitting there. It's lying there. But to lie also means to be deceitful as well. And if you think about it, the shattered visage is on the sand and it's lying. Look upon my works, you mighty, in despair. Now, I might be forcing a reading onto this because Ozymandias, when he wrote these words, when he had them carved into it, he wasn't lying. He definitely intended the world to look at what he had done and feel despair. But as it turned out, it was a lie. It was false. There was no despair after all of his works had been destroyed. That's something that you consider. I, I probably should have discussed that in the, uh, in the language section. But looking at small words like that could perhaps introduce a different interpretation or a different meaning into, uh, into your interpretation of the poem, if that makes sense. All right, we're going to move on to questions, which the students have been doing, hopefully, is they've been posting brilliant and intelligent and probably very good uh, questions as this lecture has been going on. Now I get to put them up on the screen. Look at that. Awesome. All right. So let's just go to response history so we can click on these. Okay. What is a sonnet? Now, the nice thing about this is that I can, you know, these questions show up and then hopefully they've been answered. Hopefully by now we know what a sonnet is. It's a poem with 14 lines. It's got a specific rhyme structure, which I erased. It's divided into two parts, the first eight and the last six, called the octave and the sestet. Usually it introduces a problem and then a solution. We don't really see that in this particular poem. Visage means face, which again, hopefully we've talked about. <coughs> in a translation, should you not go into the language of the poem as much as a poem originally written in English? It's a fantastic question. And the answer to that is, you can't. When you're looking at a poem in translation, there's another person between the poet and the reader. So right now, we've got Shelley, and we've got us. And we can look at pretty much what Shelley said, almost exactly. Maybe a comma is different here and there, maybe there's an ellipsis missing, but the words are all pretty much there. When you introduce a translator to mix, it goes from, for instance, Kovun to translator to us. So that word that is translated in, in the English version that we've got, we're not sure if that word comes from the translator or whether it comes from the original poet. That's why when you're studying literature and translation, it's very helpful to, um, to be fluent in the language that you're studying. Of course, we don't really have that luxury. I don't have that luxury. So when you're looking at a poem, especially a translated, when you're looking at a translated poem closely, you can't make your entire interpretation hinge on one or two words. Unless you decide to go back and get out a, a bilingual dictionary and look at what that word exactly was and talk about that. 
How does the tone end? What does the author want us to feel? That's a good question. Uh, I, think, I think what this question is asking about is the, the, the tone at the end of the poem, which I talked about being very very dry, very desolate. There's, there's not a lot of emotion in those last three lines. We have the climax of despair, and then we've got this at the end of the poem there. What does the author want us to feel? That's also a really interesting question. There's some people that believe that once a poem has been written and it's out there, then what the author intends for us to, to interpret, it doesn't matter. What matters is how we interpret it. And as long as we back up our interpretations with facts, then it doesn't really matter what the author wanted, what the original intent of the author was. And we can't twist it around. We can't say, okay, well, we've got the word traveler, and back in the 80s there was this game system called Traveler, in which it took place in like a science fictional galaxy. So I'm going to use that to interpret this meaning that this takes place on Tatooine, which I hope is the desert planet in Star Wars, and therefore Ozymandias is a reference to the Emperor. Done. I mean, that's really quite a lot of twisting. That doesn't exactly work. You've got to use internal evidence from the poem. But as, as far as what's happening in the poem, like what does the author want us to feel, like the emotion of it, I think as, as, as I said, it's the despair, the futility of our own lives. No matter what we do, it's going to be erased and forgotten in 100 years, 500 years. So why bother? It's very nihilistic, it's very depressing. Maybe what Shelley is saying then is that we shouldn't focus on stuff. We shouldn't focus on building monuments. But instead we should worry about what really matters, which is people. And that's an interpretation that's not really discussed in the poem, but it's sort of a natural buildup, right? It's, it's, it's the corollary of caring about stuff. The opposite of caring about stuff is caring about people, perhaps. How's the statue there? But then the poem says, nothing beside remains. Where did it go? So in the poem, it says here, round the decay of the, oh, sorry, nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone little sand stretch far away. So nothing beside, what, the, what is omitted in the poem is it. Nothing beside it remains. So nothing beside the wreck remains. And then round the decay of the wreck, around the decay in every direction is stretching sand. So the, the statue is still there. Is the statue actually Aussie? Ozymandias? We're assuming yes because of not only the title, but the fact that on the pedestal, right beside the, uh, the legs, it says, my name is Ozymandias. So yes, we do assume that it is. When some of the roads not taken be taken in the different versions you've been talking about by moving quotations? Yeah, absolutely. And not, just, not just that. Something I didn't talk about was um, King of Kings. Now, in the version that you've got in, uh, in the Waskata Anthology of Poetry, those words are not capitalized. Small case. In another version that I found online, they were both capitalized. And in the original version that I was using, it was capital King of Kings. Now, all three of these, regardless of the, regardless of the capitalization, it's a biblical reference. In the Bible, it talks about God being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So that means, you know, pretend in this classroom, we're all kings from different places around the globe, but I am the king of all the kings. I am the best. Ozymandias in his poem is saying that he is, he is the Lord of all the kings in the world. He is, the, he is great. He is amazing. This would be a biblical illusion. The specific, like, King of Kings with small case. It's, it's more of a, you could consider it to be more of a rhetorical effect. With all capitalized, I'm not exactly sure what the effect of that would be, but in, like I said, in the version that I saw, this is usually the transliteration um, from the languages used in the biblical scriptures, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and translated in English. That's what it usually looks like. So yeah, it, and also in the third line, stand in the desert. I don't know if you've got a period or if you've got an ellipsis, which is the three dots, which indicate a pause. You know, stand in the desert, near them, on the sand, that's different than stand in the desert, near them. It's a greater pause. There's greater distance between the trunk, or between the, the trunkless legs, 
and the uh, the shattered visage. That does that also changes our interpretation a little bit. So yeah, I think that's a good question. Thinking about the different ways that the poem has been copied onto the internet or how it appears into different books, it certainly does change what we're looking at. Now. For those of you watching this on YouTube, my students here have been assigned a specific poem that is from the late 20th century, most likely. And so their versions of the poems that they're going to be finding, they're all going to be the same. You're not going to find any versions that have these sort of issues. But when it comes to older poetry, especially poems that were written in the 19th century and before that, you have different versions. You have, uh, in Shakespearean plays, you've got different versions with different text, with different capitalization, with different spelling, of course, because spelling wasn't really standardized back then. And the further back you get into Middle English, Old English, into Germanic, you find that we run into the same issues as we were talking about with translation theory. Generally speaking, the older the text is, the less reliable the specific words are. The meaning is still there, but the words are not as reliable as in time, like time pictures. So, if there's no other questions, that'll be it. I'm Alan Friesen, Alan the Friesen, Alan at the Friesen.com. Thank you for watching.